Chris Otter is an associate professor of history at The Ohio State University. He is the author of The Victorian Eye, A Political History of Light in Victorian Britain. Um, came out at um, University of Chicago Press. His upcoming book, Diet for a Large Planet, Food Systems, World Ecology, and the Making of Industrial Britain will also be published with the University of Chicago. The book looks at causes, experience, and the consequences of Britain's experiment in massive dietary outsourcing from the 18th century. It particularly focuses on the geostrategic, biological, and ecological dimensions of this process and reflects on the planetary impact of global food systems. Thank you um, for that thorough introduction. Thank you. Uh, a history of food systems, um, which is something of a, a daunting task. Um, so what I'm going to do here is extremely skeletal. Um, I'm going to try and provide um, a set of ways, a couple of ways in which historians have approached this history, um, a 10,000-year, 12,000-year history of food systems, how that can be broken down into manageable analytic stages. I'm then going to concentrate a bit on one food system, um, the, the global meat system. And then I'm going to look at some of the unintended consequences of problematics arising um, out of uh, the shift to globalized food systems from the 18th century. This is extremely schematic, but will hopefully give some kind of context uh, for what follows. Now, um, probably the most sensible thing to do um, albeit uh, rather basic, is to uh, define food systems. Um, what exactly do we mean when we say... operative at different scales. So uh, milk systems tend to be relatively small scale. We have lots of localized systems of food markets. Much of the developing world relies upon local food systems. But there are also very large scale globalized systems, particularly in things like grain and meat. When we talk about the food system, the, the world food system, we really mean a single kind of mega system composed of many smaller subsystems. Um, and these systems also crucially um, express, materialize, and make durable the most basic kind of power relation there is, uh, the capacity of some people to control the food supply uh, of uh, others. So this 10,000-year history has a trend to it. It's a, it's a nonlinear trend. It's a contingent trend. It shouldn't be seen as something inevitable, and it shouldn't be seen as a Uh, characterization, early urban agrarian, um, referring to food systems prior to the Columbian exchange, prior to the integration of the food system by the incorporation of the Americas into it. We have smallish urban centers, large agrarian hinterlands. This is the foundational spatial division upon which human settled societies are constructed. Um, and according to James C. Scott in his recent book, Against the Grain, 
This is the foundation of everything bad, right? Inequality, asymmetrical power relations, um, taxation, the states, epidemic disease, you name it, it comes out of this original um, sort of settled system. Small scale by our standards, um, but control to surplus um, is central to political power and the division of labor. Um, also note how larger cities like Rome, for example, had food systems extending over greater distances. The Roman food system expands and extends into North Africa. A basic point here being uh, that power is associated uh, with greater distance and mobilization of a larger agricultural surplus. This is a fundamental feature of food systems. Okay, the second phase here is sometimes termed the, termed the mercantile phase with the world's first truly globalized food systems following the incorporation of the Americas into the world food system, uh, where we have and I, th this, this awful word, exotic foodstuffs, coffee, sugar, chocolate, spices being consumed in greater quantities in Europe by exploiting um, the hinterlands of the Americas. So, but there's also early outsourcing of staples, um, particularly the Netherlands utilizing Eastern Europe for grain production. And so we have emerging global asymmetries formalized in something I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, Wallerstein's World Systems Theory uh, model. A third system, um, sometimes called the settler colonial system, um, and this involves the outsourcing of staples rather than quote unquote exotics, particularly in what Alfred Crosby called the Neo-Europe's, North America, Argentina, and Australia, supplying a huge agricultural surplus um, of grain and, sorry, I said huge, a bit like Donald Trump then, I apologize. <laughs> uh, grain and meat uh, being funneled into Europe, uh, particularly Britain. This is what my research has focused on, this, this grand outsourcing project. There's a gigantic rise in global food production during this period, a great rise in the distance over which food travels, and a tremendous rise in the um, energy consumed by the food system. World food production increased by about 18 times from 1750 to 2000. So this is something cornucopians love to cite. Finally, this is a muddy, messy phase, productivist neoliberals. Sometimes this phase is broken down into several discrete stages, but broadly speaking, since World War II, there is widespread agreement that there is such a thing as a world food system which can be managed, steered, or governed um, by things like the FAO and so forth. Um, World agricultural production accelerates again. This phase is also associated with American dominance of the world food system in terms of its capacity to use its um, surplus for geostrategic ends. There's also a tendency towards food crises seen in the 70s, um, seen post-World War II, and also seen today. These kind of compound rolling crises, uh, financial, uh, energy, and climate all interwoven. Okay, the second way of conceiving world food system history is eco-technically. Um, to see food systems as complex material systems um, incorporating biological and technological elements. And for simplicity's sake, I'm gonna break this down into two, organic and mineral. Organic referring um, to non-fossil fuel-based food systems. These are food systems which rely on human power, water power, animal power, wind power. A uh, mineral system involves the shift to fossil fuel and also atmospheric control with mechanical refrigeration and so forth. Okay. Um, food systems have been completely organic throughout most of world history, but the shift to fossil fuels is critical. We can't really talk about uh, modern food systems without thinking about energy. Um, the adoption of fossil fuels affected every aspect of the food system, from the use of fertilizers to the pro to processing and distribution. This increased the speed and scale of world food systems, and I think that the scaling up of food systems since the 18th century through fossil fuel use is the most, probably the most critical rupture in the history of world food systems. We get the rise of food miles, this is demonstrable in the 19th century, innovations in refrigeration and atmospheric control, and control uh, of food and fossil fuels becomes 
increasingly interwoven. In 1929, uh, E.W. Shanahan, um, in a book on refrigeration, refre reflected on what refrigeration did to the world food system. It stimulated, quote, the territorial division of production and inter-hemisphere transportation, binding the urban Anglo-American North to the pastoral lands of the global South. I want to now give a concrete um, example, um, meat. Um, an organic meat system involves droving, uh, that is moving animals over sometimes quite large distances to market or to fattening um, under their own locomotion. Meat mobility was limited by salting, pickling and drying uh, and nothing uh, else. Now in the 19th century, the growing desire for meat in Europe and particularly Britain led to the shipping of prime livestock out to the New World and Australasia to create new breeds purely for the purpose of exporting uh, back to Europe. Um, this is a, a Hereford with its white face. We can also talk about large white English pigs, Lincoln sheep, and so on. This is a biological phenomenon of uh, creating new breeds purely for European uh, markets. Now, originally, um, these animals were shipped back to Europe live. Um, as you can see here, this wasn't the most um, kind of processes. Um, the problem was solved by steam and, trans uh, and uh, refrigeration. Refrigerated railway cars then made uh, Chicago the center of the American meatpacking uh, industry. And, and these two things really, if you like, um, fossil fuel-based transportation and refrigeration enabled Europeans to use New World land for livestock farming on a completely um, unprecedented scale. This is a map of Argentina with a sort of concentrated um, area devoted to livestock farming. These are and were European uh, breeds. Um, they then developed something called the cold chain. The world dates from 1908, which linked these livestock frontiers uh, with uh, European uh, metropolises, abattoirs, and cold stores. These places were veritable industrial colonies. There were huge plants built in North America, Argentina, and Australasia. By 1907, there were 27 huge abattoirs in Australia, largely for the export trade. So it's funneling this meat over large distances in refrigerated or frozen form. It obviously reached its apogee in uh, early, early 20th century America with its vast packing plants, and it's no surprise the word biotechnology was coined uh, to describe these systems in 1919. The carcass was also integrated into other industrial complexes. It became an industrial feedstock, like coal or petroleum. Great economies of scale in these abattoirs meant the meat system could be interwoven with other systems, gelatin extracted from bones, and along with that, culled from skin, tendons, and connective tissue is used to make products typical of the second industrial revolution. Photographic plates, medicinal capsules, bacteriological cultures, dog biscuits, um, and uh, candy. Um, intestines and weasons became sausages, violin strings, snuff packages, um, tennis strings. This is a tennis string factory. Uh, this is, this is, these are intestines becoming tennis strings. And apparently, um, as tennis players became more potent and powerful with their serving in the early 20th century, um, these new intestinal um, strings were very important. So there's a sort of weird dialectic between tennis playing and animal slaughter here. Um, <laughs> glands are also um, important. Chilled, packed glands supplied the early endocrinological endocrinolo uh, and pharmaceutical industry, pancreatic, pituitary, thyroid, testicular, suprarenal. Um, insulin was reaped from pancreases. Um, it took about 25,000 suprarenal glands to make one pound of purified epinephrine. So when we talk about the meat system, we're also talking about its incorporation into other systems. Now, I in this accelerated post-1945 world, um, the global meat industry shifted dramatically towards monogastric animals, pigs and chickens, which have higher feed conversion rates and in some ways are more industrializable in heavily mineralized, biotechnical, bio productivist, and neoliberal regimes, uh, the chicken um, has undergone the most dramatic industrialization of all. Uh, the broiler industry, along with confined pigs, feedlot cattle, and enclosed dairy cows, has become the most intensified um, form 
of livestock production on Earth, and I'm sure m most of you are familiar with this. Um, an industrially produced chicken uh, now actually lives 42 days. Its life is truncated by a, a day or so every few years as we manage to telescope its existence into shorter and shorter frames of time. Um, the number of chickens killed annually rose from 6 billion in 1960 to 50 billion uh, today. And it's sort of symbolized in the rise of, of the ubiquitous chicken nugget, which was invented by a Cornell professor uh, in the 1970s. The scale of this process, the totality of biomanipulation and biological control has made the chicken an ideal candidate to be, and I quote from the Guardian here, the animal of the Anthropocene, uh, or at the very least paradigmatic of, of what uh, environmental historians call the post-1945 Great Acceleration, when almost every human activity and ecological impact intensified. Okay, that's enough about chickens. Um, in the final part of the paper, I want to look at some unintended emergent consequences of large-scale food systems. And this, I think, will um, tie into some of the themes of the conference as we move on. Um, the three areas I want to look at here are first, violence, second, health, and third, ecology. Food systems have always been about creating a surplus for those who don't farm. They they're all, they have a foundational asymmetry um, at their core. And larger scale food systems, mercantile um, and settler colonial, allowed the West to begin to digest a global surplus. Um, even if meat frontiers like Australia and Argentina developed a, a great passion for uh, meat consumption, um, this was normalized via the Ricardian concept of, of comparative um, advantage and created vast resource frontiers. And these global resource frontiers were often created through the extermination or displacement of first peoples. We see this with Canadian Matisse populations, Argentinian gauchos, and um, Australi Australian aborigines. Famine um, is perhaps the paradigmatic example of the violence of food systems. Um, before the Irish potato famine, um, political economists in Britain already regarded Ireland as economically backward, and they routinely referred to Ireland's, quote, redundant population. This was a, a common term in early 19th century political economy, who contributed little uh, to meat and wheat uh, production. Uh, according to The Economist um, in 1848, Ireland would be shorn of unproductive life and redundant labor. Um, this is not malign um, indifference. This is proto-disaster capitalism in action. The aim here from the British state is to use famine to forcibly restructure uh, Ireland towards a kind of potato-less future as a place which would just grow grain um, and livestock for British uh, consumption. This is achieved by indifference to starvation, the encouragement of emigration, and mass eviction, which produced a more dispersed population. Ireland is the only place in Europe whose population is lower today than it was in 1840. Another important thing here, another important, uh, actually I don't have a slide for this, um, is that by the 1930s, the ratio of cattle to humans was larger in Ireland than anywhere else in Europe. So Britain had kind of succeeded in swapping humans for livestock here. And we see the same story um, in Indian famines um, in the 19th century as well, with railways vaunted as these mineral technologies of famine relief actually funneling resources away uh, from famine sufferers. This would be formalized um, through the idea of the impoverishing drain of wealth from, um, from India. Again, under development and food systems and the asymmetries therein are inseparable. And this is a violent dimension here. The global south um, is becoming a shock absorber for the world economy. It's a visceral manifestation of global inequality. Um, there's also a military dimension to this. Um, the command of food systems becomes absolutely essential to allied success in both world wars. Um, Britain was the least self-reliant economy in Europe in 1914, 
Um, but through this food system, it was able to militarize this food system, militarize its food chains, reconfigure its logistical systems, and beat Germany in warfare by blockading Germany and maintaining its old, own food imports. Um, there's little doubt one recent analysis states that British leaders intended to starve the German people and hope the suffering inflicted would destroy morale. Churchill said this explicitly in the, in the world crisis. Um, Germany began the war with confident predictions that it would win purely because of its food system. It slipped into the infamous turnip winter and its food system, which was ultimately less globalized, um, played a major role in its defeat. Um, the asymmetrical effects can be seen um, afterwards in the sort of famine map of Europe from 1919. The estimates here are over a million people perished in uh, Germany and Austria as a consequence of the British blockade. Now, um, the blockade then catalyzed and was catalyzed anti-Semitism. The fusion of starvation and anti-Semitism created Hitler's genocidal vision of control of the Eastern European food supply, which underpinned much of Germany's strategic plan, the hunger plan in World War II. This sort of control of the whole of Eastern Europe and simply wiping out 30 million people. That was the plan. Um, then the food would be purely used to feed uh, Germans. Um, so food systems, we have to remember, can quite literally be used as instruments of extermination. Okay. Switch to health. The 20th century has seen a tremendous rise in human heights, particularly in the West, which is related to, um, in many ways, a better diet, a more plentiful diet, a more protein-rich diet, and very often better maternal health as a consequence of maternal feeding. So we, we can't forget this, um, but at the same time, this diet has brought with it a raft of new health disorders, from constipation and tooth decay through to diabetes, uh, obesity, and heart disease. Um, so radical change in diet has kind of scrambled um, human metabolism, dis uh, disturbing the body's hormonal infrastructure and the complex signaling pathways underpinning uh, appetite um, and fat storage. Now another dimension here, uh, we can probably talk about obesity and so forth later, is the emergence of new pathogens within the ecological spaces of food systems. Their size, scale, and complexity creates milieu within which new pathogens can thrive. Um, one example here, um, E. coli 0157H7. The defining clinical features of this virulent form of E. coli are bloody diarrhea, and in serious cases, hemolytic uremic syndrome, HUS, which can lead to death. These are novel virulence factors. It's an old pathogen that's acquired virulence factors, and the question is why. This erupted in the 1980s. The answer almost certainly lies in the food system and the meat system itself. The rise of grain feeding, the use of antibiotics, which has changed the, um, the uh, um, intestinal flora of cattle, the scale of feedlots, homogenization, homogenization of cattle, increasing consumption of hamburgers, global circula uh, circulation of meat, have all created a new evolutionary space for the emergence of pathogens. So we see it recently, um, the recent outbreak of E. coli 0157 um, seems to be caused by runoff from livestock farms near salad production zones in Yuma, Arizona. But note where the food poisoning erupts. Again, distance and scale are vital. Intensified poultry and pig production in uh, East Asia has been, uh, has been implicated in novel strains of influenza. So there's very specific public health threats emerging from global food systems. The final thing I want to talk about is ecology. Um, as I was just discussing um, before this paper, to feed Britain, we I involved the ecological reconfiguration of places at the literal opposite end of the earth, most notably perhaps New Zealand. Forests cut down, monocultures created, fences built. Um, in my uh, forthcoming book, um, I call this the large planet philosophy. This is the thing that uh, Francis Moore LePay eventually critiqued. The notion that there's basically no limit to the amount of raw materials that can be drawn across vast planetary uh, distances. And this was taken further 
by Britain than other European countries, leading to enormous what's called ghost acreage, a, a country that's exceeded its biophysical carrying uh, limits. If you look at, um, sorry uh, for this picture of British food so early in the day, if you look at a, um, the iconic full English breakfast becoming popular in the 1880s, it's bacon, eggs, butter, toast, tea and sugar were almost entirely imported uh, from Denmark, Russia, Canada, India, Argentina, Germany and the Caribbean. So this breakfast, this full English breakfast is, is founded on uh, the idea of outsourcing. The consciousness of ecological limits had temporarily at least been suspended. The transient luxury here of behaving as if growth was potentially unlimited and sustainable. Now, this would eventually be critiqued and formalized in, in, in works by um, George Borgstrom, William Catton, through ideas of phantom carrying capacity or ecological overshoot. The idea that if everybody eats like this, that we don't have enough room for this. And, and this is something very much implanted in the Anglo world, not just in Britain, but in the United States, in Canada, in New Zealand, in, in Australia. At the same time, um, there are many efforts to escape land limits by utopians and cornucopians. Um, for example, vertical farming, uh, cultured meat, hydroponics, and with due apologies to my friend with whom I was discussing this beforehand, um, space farming. This is a diagram of um, Russian attempts on Mir to a space farm. Food systems are often ignored when we talk about the Anthropocene, our current geological epoch. Um, but they're absolutely essential to the biophysical reconfiguration of the planet, which is at the root of today's environmental crisis. Now, if you look at this diagram of the supposed um, nine planetary boundaries, which, if crossed, lead to full-scale um, environmental crisis, two of these boundaries have been, have been exceeded. These are genetic diversity and biochemical flows. These are the two that are most closely related to world food systems. They're closely related to this new, these food systems we've been discussing here. Um, first, biochemical flows of phosphorus and nitrogen. Early food systems produced the urban-rural dichotomy and the necessity for manure, which was all organic until the 19th century, when the system was being placed under strain by economic growth and population increase. What followed from the early 19th century in Europe was a ceaseless quest to find new forms of fertilizer, and using industrial byproducts, mining for coprolites, uh, creating superphosphates, uh, one of famous example obviously being guano um, in Peru, uh, Chilean nitrates, before the ultimate fix, um, Fritz Haber's uh, creation of um, mineralized nitrate fertilizers from 1909. This is often seen as being the most important technological innovation of the 20th century. Humans were catapulted into what was called the fertilizer epoch, meaning that um, food production, fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, actually became even more tightly intertwined. The rate of anthropogenic nitrogen creation uh, rose more than tenfold between 1860 and 2000 to around 165 teragrams, um, which is dreadfully big. Um, nitrogen cascading and spiraling accumulating in aquatic and atmospheric reservoirs, and along with emissions, nitrogen emissions from power plants and cars. This has caused eutrophication, acidification of waterways, and the accumulation of tropospheric ozone and greenhouse gases. So this sort of nitrogen history is inseparable from climate change. And if we go back to this, the second threshold of genetic diversity is commonly referred to as the sixth extinction. If you look at geography of the world meat system, this is a map from 1931 showing um, a world cattle population of about 600 million and its accumulation in spaces largely created by Europeans for their own consumption. And these hinterlands, Argentina, Australia, Canada and so forth, were among the least densely populated places on earth. 
So these areas that are devoted to cattle, not humans. Just, to, if, uh, just as a, uh, a bit of uh, data here, in 1928, Canada's population density per square mile, 2.6. Argentina's um, 8.6. Australia's 2.1. England and Wales, 6.71. So th this form of feeding relies upon these hinterlands. Um, some of the consequences here. Reduction in effective population size. There are more cattle but reduced genetic diversity. Therefore, more potential emergence of genetic problems in those cattle. 90% of US dairy cows today are, are Holsteins. There's huge numbers of chickens but very little genetic diversity. The increasing uh, volume of bovine, ovine, and porcine biomass relative to wild mammalian biomass. Um, and species and breed reduction. And the idea of a sixth extinction was mooted in the, in the 19th century. Darwin, for example, in The Origin of Species, um, described, and I quote, the process of extermination among our domestic cattle, noting how the ancient black cattle of Yorkshire were displaced, quote, by the longhorns and then replaced by shorthorns. There's an acceleration of turnover of animal breeds, the creation and destruction of breeds according to taste and shifting market conditions. That, and in 1974, um, Britain founded its Rare Breed Survival Trust, which has a semen bank and a large stockpile of frozen embryos of these ver often very short-lived animal breeds. This gives you some sense of how um, today uh, global biomass is increasingly composed of livestock, wild animal biomass is tremendously reduced. Vaxlav Schmill wrote an article where he be began by saying, you know, if aliens landed on Earth, they'd think that cattle were in control, so because there's just so much cow on Earth. And in a recent book, The End of the Wild, my apologies there, um, Stephen Meyer stated that non-human non life is becoming a peculiarly homogenized assemblage of organisms unnaturally selected for their compatibility with one fundamental force us. And I'm going to conclude with a quote from Jonathan Wells' recent beast of a book, uh, The Metabolic Ghetto. Um, being the primary medium of modern power relations, nutrition must also be the primary medium in which costs are expressed. And it's important that we note when we talk about, we're going to talk a lot about the human dimensions, the human costs here that these costs are also felt ecologically, they're felt zoologically, they're felt botanically, they're felt by animals, they're felt by plants to the extent that plants can feel. That's a philosophical question that we don't need to address. Um, the chemical levels too, at scales from the local to uh, the planetary. So food systems are in many ways a very good way of thinking about the history of, of life in general. Thank you very much. <laughs> you wanted to sit here. much for this uh, thought-provoking presentation. I think it allows us to uh, have a, an example for the to all of historians in this interdisciplinary discussion. Your observation regarding geopolitically and eco-technologically approaches in the study of food systems could be extended for us to think about the role of humanities in environmental sciences. Um, I was told that I should talk for 10 minutes, but I think we should take the time for questions. Um, I think that the only thing that I, um, that I really wanted to say is part of the current mission of historians who care to reconstruct bridges between history and earth sciences, because historically there are different connections, 
uh, is that we have to reconsider the Foucauldian concept of biopolitics. Indeed, historians have adopted this term zealously in studies of anything from fascism to history of birth control, but they often cared very little about the bio part of biopolitics. While uh, presenting politics as contingent and constantly changing, they have mistakenly overlooked the ways in which bodies and organic materials have very similar qualities. My question is about uh, the violent aspect of food systems that you presented. Have you seen any examples for food in history that did not involve violence, either towards animals, the planet, uh, workers in food industry, or native populations, which you so vividly uh, presented? Now we're gonna collect, I think, more questions. Yeah, read out the hard ones, all right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, is that better? All right, I, I hate these things. I, they, uh, all right, I have nightmares. Okay, the first question is about refrigerating meat supply chains um, and how you connect that to land use, especially if you think of um, feed production like soy. Even local pork or chicken isn't 100% local because of the soy feed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just also quickly respond to the bloke at the back who asked the question earlier on. I, I mean, yes, um, it's, it's palpably obvious that uh, methane uh, and so forth and the emissions caused by land clearances for soy production contribute heavily to, uh, to, to climate change and that a, a, a reduction in, in meat consumption, not an obliteration of meat consumption, we don't have to all become vegans, um, but cutting down on meat production, particularly beef consumption, uh, maybe switching to insects. Um, th there's a lot of people into that these days. Um, yeah, so, so absolutely. In terms of refrigeration and land use, I mean, I think that refrigerated systems meant that more land could be devoted to the production of meats and therefore more land um, given over to, um, to feed and also intensified the inputs of fossil fuels into the system. So it's a twofold ecological uh, problem. So, so yes, that's what I'd, I'd clearly say to that. Um, there's a question, should the modern food system be repaired or redesigned completely? Oh, <laughs> that's oh a big my question, words. yeah. <laughs> that, that's, that, I mean, the, the sort of, the typical answer here is I'm a historian, um, <laughs> so I don't know. Um, I, I think that the, the food system as it stands today is one of the structural reasons why we are in the environmental mess that we are in. Uh, it it's has a, a large amount of, of momentum. Uh, simply by just going about our daily lives, consuming the way we're consuming, we reinforce this system, and this system is, this large planet philosophy is ultimately unsustainable. So um, radical redesign would be a, would be a good thing, um, but we're not very good at radically redesigning things until something's gone horribly wrong. And um, I'm pretty pessimistic ab about this. I, I'm, I, I suspect that um, it's gonna take some kind of huge crisis before we really do something about this. That, that's, that's just me, I'm a miserable Englishman, so. <laughs> Another question really follows the same, I think. Uh, the question is, uh, the rise of sustainability of okay. the paradigm actually made a significant change in food systems in the past 30 years. Has it? Yeah. Um, I can I'll probably leave it ultimately to other people to answer, but I think there's, there's something we call the Jevons paradox, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, which is that we, which uh, uh, was developed by the British political economist uh, W. Jevons in the 1870s, which states that the moment we make something more efficient, we simply start consuming more of it. And there is a danger with sustainability, which has become a very corporatized term, uh, very co-opted. Um, I go to Kroger, everything's sustainable, everything's green, um, and it makes me feel slightly better when I buy something, um, and perhaps it makes me feel I can, bu I can buy it and eat more of it. Um, my a cynical response is no, sustainability hasn't made much difference and perhaps might be rather dangerous. 
as a concept. We can unpack it and unpick it later. Um, and that's a sweeping um, and rather caustic answer, but that's what I would say initially. I think that the next question also follows the same path, asking you if current technological innovations such as vertical farming are solutions for the technical mis or, or just new technical mistakes, um, okay. just like synthesized fertilizers? Mm. Well, uh, scholars of technology always talk about unintended consequences by which they mean that any novel technology, however well-intentioned, always brings with it problems that couldn't be foreseen. Um, I spent a, a week or so ago, I was at a conference in England where I, I got to hang out with Mark Post, um, who is the scientist responsible for developing the world's first cultured meats. Um, great guy, uh, is a utopian, cornucopian kind of character for whom, and he was speaking to a group of, um, of sort of literary professors, largely humanists. He was the only scientist in the room and he came in and gave his paper and started talking about progress and saying how um, this is progress, humans progress. We always move towards something better. And, and it, these, all these sort of lit people were just like, what, progress? You can't talk about progress. There was a tremendous debate and discussion about progress. And I think what got lost in that is that it's easy sometimes for us to be overcritical of people who are genuinely well-intentioned about creating um, products that might make the world food system more sustainable. That said, um, cultured meat keeps us on a kind of meat track. Um, it's still enormously expensive. He claimed that the fossil fuel inputs are, are minimal, that this solves the energy problem of food. It can't do that. Thermodynamics always states that. The Jevons paradox comes in. Well, if you've got cheap meat that's produced by sort of injecting something into a cow's buttock and then culturing it, um, and it's very cheap, we're, we're going to simply end up consuming enormous quantities of the stuff and get us and keep ourselves in, in the same problem. Vertical farming, I mean, the guy who wrote the book on vertical farming, I forget his name. I mean, this is an astonishing work of, um, of utopianism. I mean, he's basically, these, land, these vertical farming landscapes, are they might as well be on the moon. You have to wear a special suit to go in them. They, they completely expunge all, all, all dangerous microbes from these. They're creating these super technologically utopian spaces um, to grow a bunch of lettuce. <laughs> and it, again, sometimes it seems just dreadfully naive. Sometimes it's easy to sit here and say people who are going out and trying to solve the world food crisis are being naive. That, that's, it's easy to say that. But I do see a tremendous amount of naivety in, in, in these projects. And it's not really getting at the real question of our own consumption habits. It's this, these are simply ways of saying we can keep consuming in the same way and we can, we can find a way of engineering ourselves out of the crisis rather than saying maybe it's time for us to start eating differently. So I think that we're going to conclude on that note. Uh, thank you so much for the Thanks. presentation, and I'm going to give you all of these questions. That all right, thank you. Thanks a lot.